Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Donna Thiesel, and I'm your host of The Edge on IAC Radio, your source for news and entertainment. You may also find us on television, channel 182 on Charter Communications, and Abundance Television. We are syndicated there, found on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. And don't forget the podcast. Now, they're doing a little redo up on that, so you're going to have a lot of... I think it's going to be much, much better than what we had before. And I liked it before. I was good with it. We have Alan Mendenhall with us right now. And Alan is, a, he's a regular on the show and has been for many years. Um, I always like to talk with you about finances, among other things. Um, so this looming thing is hanging over our heads. It's a government shutdown. It's, you know, all these little creepy, creepy things. Now, it depends on who you listen to. Mm-hmm. Okay, listen to CNN. Nice little old ladies are not going to be able to get their government checks, their Social Security. Um, the whole world's going to stop. Is that necessarily true? Uh, no, they, that's not true. I mean, the federal government uh, it employs millions of people. And so things like processing Social Security checks are going to happen. If you recall, uh, when the government shut down during the Obama administration, Obama closed the national parks and set up some guards to uh, stand outside the national national parks so that people couldn't get in. Well, this actually involved putting more people in place, employing more people in order to shut it down. And it was all grandstanding. And there was no need for even those parks to um, close. So no, this is not going to be a, a, a tremendous deal. There are many, many, many people uh, who are employed by the federal government and the people who are probably going to be most likely to be affected would probably be the uh, employees who may not have to go to work. Um, They may have to work from home or something like that for for some time. And in fact, I think uh, the best part about a government shutdown would be to show how much of the government we don't actually need operating. That's an oxymoron right there. I think it would be the best thing, maybe to shine, shed a little light, like you just said. On um, well, yeah, there there are actually a number of proposals on the table uh, about shutting down the Department of Education should a uh, Republican win in twenty twenty four. And in these uh, proposals, they just have certain functions of the DOE, the Department of Education, getting transitioned to other departments, and it. And then and other other things just being purely eliminated that, that seem to be just unnecessary. So, you know, that's just one example of many where we could probably be streamlining a lot of things, especially given the, you know, 30 plus trillion dollars of debt that we're in. Um, you know, if, if, if you or I tried to run our household the way the federal government runs its budget, we would be beyond, I mean, we, we wouldn't just be bankrupt, we'd be you know, we'd be digging ourselves out of debt for the rest of our lives. And it's just so irresponsible that we allow our federal government to operate in that same way. I think the best example, too, of that, you just mentioned the best example, but I'm going to come up with another one. And this has to do with global warming. Okay, so you're flying all over the world. Everybody is meeting. They're flying, using jets, by the way. Private um, jets. Yeah. All over the world. Couldn't you just do a Zoom meeting? I mean, do you have to do all of that? I, that, that is a really good point. I think the uh, World Economic Forum that meets in Davos, Switzerland, yeah. is always criticized because they are purportedly saving the world and getting the world to net zero and fighting, uh, you know, uh, fighting for climate change, um, you know, resolutions and um, fixes and all the rest. But you have a bunch of billionaires flying in on their private jets and who knows how much carbon they're releasing into the atmosphere in the process of hosting that meeting. And it's a legitimate quick criticism. Uh, you can, I, I you, you can zoom them all in and they, you know, they could have the same meeting. I think so too. And then there are people who are followers and who follow everything they hear. And then there are people who are skeptics and will always ask this question. And it doesn't mean you're an evil person because you ask a question. And so I'm one of those. I'm more likely to follow someone who leads by example. You know, if you really believe this stuff, you would put a stop to just those meetings would be enough to say, okay, I'm going to look at it then. Yeah. I would look at it. Yeah. And on a lot of climate related, environmental related science, I 
have no opinion whatsoever. I don't know. I'm not an expert. I believe in the division of labor and uh, specialization. And so I can't be an expert in climate change because I have all these other fields that I study and research and no one person can be an expert in everything. There's just too much information out there. So I really don't have strong opinions about it. I mean, I think, you know, it's great to try to help the environment, I, you know, but I, I also think that government is the biggest polluter, pollutes more than private enterprise. And if we want to find solutions, we need to privatize those solutions and let, let entrepreneurship and innovation do the work that governments can't do. I think so too. And again, lead by example. You know, Ed Begley does, movie star, and uh, he really, really believes in climate change. He really believes this is going to be the end of civilization. But now also he does not fly in a plane. You can look him up. I mean, he's, I would be more likely to listen to what he says about it. Because again, he rides his bicycle everywhere he goes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> literally. Yeah. And I mean, hey, this guy really believes in it. You don't find him buying a mansion out on the the coast of the water either. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he really, really believes this stuff. So I'll listen to somebody who really believes in it and the yeah, cause. Sure. But otherwise forget it. So, so government shutdown, is it going to happen? Do you think? Uh, well, we always go right up to the brink and then there's some compromise that happens. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it's, it's happened before, but when it did happen, it wasn't a big deal and things got resolved within a few days. I don't recall the exact details, but I know it happened. Well, I guess it was 2013, 14 ish, somewhere in that range uh, when Obama was still president and the sky didn't fall, the world didn't end and things weren't that big of a deal. And in fact, the Obama administration had to um, grandstand and try to make a big deal out of it to try to to try to get people to care because they're people celebrating. And mm -hmm. I think they realized that, oh, the vast majority of people are not going to see any effect whatsoever in their day to day experience. So let's go shut down the national parks, which, by the way, wasn't a requirement of the shutdown. But let's go do that just so that we can irritate some people so that there will be people out there complaining. Otherwise, no one will even notice. And that would be dangerous if no one noticed when the government shut down. And like you said, they actually spent money to hire more employees to oversee this whole thing. So the whole thing was just a, a fiasco. I pulled up an article and uh, what is government shutdown, that kind of thing. But it was also um, in the article is how might a 2023 shutdown differ from previous shutdowns. You just mentioned that. But then what actually happens um, now, this is another question, and this was actually brought to my attention from one of our listeners, and so they wanted me to ask you. I told them you were going to be on the show. So, do government employees, did they miss a check? I mean, even though they're, fur they're working from home or whatever they need to do, are they still being paid? Uh, yes, I believe most of them are being paid, uh, and um, I think that there are potentially some who will um, have a delayed paycheck, but they may not, I mean, they're not going to not get paid. I think there are something like, I mean, there, there are a number of federal employees who will be um, furloughed um, until the shutdown ends and um, they, they're going to be paid for the hours work. They're not going to miss paychecks, but um, you know, I, what that would, potentially show to me is that maybe there's some jobs in the federal government that just aren't indispensable, you know, that maybe we can do without some of these people. That that would be the question that would be even more interesting is if there are people not getting paychecks, but things are still running, then maybe these people aren't necessary. Maybe we don't need a massive bureaucracy up there in the federal government. Maybe we can be a little bit leaner and operate as private enterprise would if you uh, if you are um, sort of saturated with people that don't really have tasks to do in private enterprise, that'd be a waste of, of resources and you would need to uh, let go of people. And that doesn't mean that, you know, those people aren't going to find jobs elsewhere because in private competition, that's where you spur innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's where you have 
a, a form of competition that generates way more jobs and way more business. Um, the federal government does not actually produce anything. It, it does not generate. It does not invent. It does not create. That's what private business does. All federal government does is extract wealth from people. It extracts wealth from businesses. It extracts wealth from individuals. And then it just moves it around. It doesn't create new wealth. It just takes from other people's wealth and just shifts it around and moves it from one place to another without actually adding any value to um, society. And that's that's a model that's not very helpful. We had some elected officials a few years ago, and, and I was really proud to call them friends. Jim Ziegler, the oh, Alabama yeah. State Auditor, um, he said, why do I need a laptop? I've got my own cell phone. I mean, you know, so he, did, he forfeited that. And then also he said, I don't need all these employees. Yeah. And so, you know, he said, I think we can run efficiently that way. And then also Alabama Secretary of State John Merrill did the same thing. He said, I, I just don't think we need all of this. I think we can be efficient without it. Yeah. And I think Andrew Sorrell, who is uh, now our auditor, is doing a good job in this mm -hmm. in this front as well. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So we have some people, again, in the Alabama part of things who actually see the light. Um, and a lot of these folks have been in private industry before, so they get it. They totally understand. It's folks who have been in the government forever who don't seem to get it. Mm. Yeah, because that's, well, that's all they've ever done. I agree with that. And I know, uh, speaking of Andrew in particular, he was an entrepreneur in college. He mm -hmm. created a textbook uh, industry. He would go onto college campus and buy all these textbooks from students as they were leaving their final exams, for example. And so they were done with the class. They're like, yeah, you can, you, I, you can, I'll sell my textbook to you, of course. And he would buy all these textbooks and then he would resell them online for a profit, mm -hmm. created a whole business industry doing that. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing about that is the people who were buying those books from him were not paying as much. Mm -hmm. Plus he was able to make a profit as if it were a brand new spanking new book. So that's right. a really smart thing to do. So those are the kinds of people I would love to see in, in the government. Yeah. Folks like Andrew. Yeah. I think Andrew is doing a great job and um, is well positioned as a constitutional officer to have a bright uh, political career in our state. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a few minutes uh, about running a business versus the government. I mean, what, you've already touched on most of those things, but let's talk about people who are actually the, the candidates for president of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them get it. What? Okay, let's just say something unforeseen happens and Trump is not on the ticket. For the folks who are in place right now, well, who do you mean of the, of the other Republicans? I like Vivek Ramaswamy. I, I happen to have a, a somewhat of a relationship with him, knowing him um, through business and, and other forms. So, um, I might be slightly biased towards him for that reason, but he obviously is a is an entrepreneur and has been in business. Um, you know, the interesting thing about this election is that both Trump and Biden are fairly unpopular in polling. But there's a big poll that came out this weekend that said um, three quarters of voters are concerned about Biden's age and mental fitness, and that cannot be good for him. Um, and I also believe that the poll. Uh, showed Trump with like winning 40 points over his nearest Republican opponent. So it looks as though Trump is going to be the nominee. I don't see anybody else coming in behind. DeSantis was next, but way, way behind. And yeah. Um, yeah. so at this point, it looks as though Trump's going to be the nominee and we'll see what happens, you know, with the indictment in Georgia and what that means for the election. I don't know. I, I'm really not sure how that will play out, but uh uh, you know, I think this th this other poll showing uh, Biden Biden trailing behind Trump is significant because I don't see Biden doing anything between now and election day that will give him a boost. I mean, he is in sort of rapid decline, and there's nothing you can do to reverse that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the Democrats, I really believe they've seriously got to consider a replacement candidate. And it cannot be Kamala Harris because she is more unpopular than um, than Biden. No, she is. She's not popular at all. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't consider age in anything. And the reason I, I don't is I have an aunt who is about to be 102 years old, lives by herself, 
does her own cooking, does not want to be petted. I mean, she wants to be a live human being, but her mind is good. Mm -hmm. um, Donna, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, she is. I mean, she's on top of it all. So I would putting her, she would be able to run presidency of the United States. <laughs> I, I, she, I mean, she got it going on. So the coalition, what Democrats say is, well, you know, Trump's up in age. But I don't think there's a comparison as far as their mind and the way they think. Well, the old the old phrase is age is just a number. And there is a lot of truth to that. Some people yeah, yeah. are very sharp. In, in their old age and some people aren't and that's not something that automatically happens as as you get older i mean th there's nothing that magically happens when you turn 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know some people age better than others and there are things you can do about it to help yourself last longer things you can do you know to give yourself mind exercises to sort of mm -hmm. prevent the onset of alzheimer's and things like that but if, if, if that's your fate, you're going to get it no matter what, you know, like, uh, you know, you can do all the brain exercises in the world, but if you're meant to have Alzheimer's, you're going to have Alzheimer's. And I think so too. There are a lot so, of brilliant but, people who've had it. But the thing about Biden is, is he has a career of gaffes. I mean, it's not just recently. You know, he ran into a flag last week and, um, you know, oh. the, forgotten handshake and they're just little things he does that if this were Trump, I mean, it would really be exposed and all the media would be talking about it. You know? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, I you know, I, I do think that the media notices, I, at least the sort of Fox news media, Newsmax and others yeah, yeah. Are, are definitely picking up on this. And uh, I also think, you know, I'm beginning to look at Twitter or X as it's now called, as a medium of information and i get information more quickly through x than i do through the legacy media and i also get kind of unfiltered information now are there artificial intelligence you know generated sort of misinformation disinformation yeah there was one image of cory booker last week that popped up instantly on twitter saying, okay, they changed the dress code in the Senate for uh, Fetterman, and this is what Cory Booker wore this week, and it was like the really short pink shorts with the pink uh -huh. first it. and it was, it was artificially, uh, it was AI-generated uh, artwork and, and uh, was not serious, but you could have taken it to be serious, but then, you know, anybody that sort of had a notion that, oh, uh, this may not be real, you could in a few seconds on Twitter, figure out that, no, that wasn't real. You just have to know what you're doing, but it does, uh, you know, this new, this new sort of instantaneous un unfiltered um, media is interesting because you'll get things that normally wouldn't be reported things about sort of uh, uh, groups that maybe get a pass because they're part of a historically marginalized or disenfranchised group. And uh, mm -hmm. so they've, it, it doesn't fit the narrative. You want them, the, the, the legacy media wants them to always be the good guys and never to have a bad story reported about them. But then you see on Twitter uh, an example of some of them doing a lot of bad things. And those stories would never get reported in the media, but the, here they are for everyone to see. And I think that's healthy because we should really be making our decisions based on facts and reality and not just on narratives that authorize people spin for the population's consumption. You know, everybody should be able to disseminate information that's relevant and let people form their own um, uh, opinions about facts, but let the facts get out there. We need as much facts and, and data as we can get in order to have informed opinions about things. So let all the facts get out there rather than having it all get mediated through the legacy media, which can um, manufacture stories the way they would like to present them. People need to ask more questions. You know, if something doesn't feel right, first of all, if anyone tries to shove information down my throat, I don't care who it is, whatever side it's on. I always start this little thing like, hold it, hold it. Where did you get your information from? You know, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not just sitting listening to information on either side. 
Well, no, and I agree with that. I think uh, a healthy skepticism is is always mm -hmm. um, useful. I, one of my favorite philosophers is David Hume, and although I Hume was uh, criticized as being an atheist, and I am not, I am a Christian, I still uh, appreciate Hume's approach to matters because he was very scientific in his ways of thinking, and he wanted to not form opinions based upon error. And if he was presented with um, facts that demonstrated veracity, then he would form an opinion. But if he didn't have enough facts or felt that he doubted the circumstances, he would just um, withhold judgment, just suspend judgment. Why, why form an opinion based on uh, error? That wouldn't make sense. That would only add more error to uh, human society. And that's the last thing we need. Uh, Immanuel Kant, another enlightenment thinker, defined the enlightenment as freedom from your self-incurred tutelage, meaning you need to form opinions based on uh, not just pure deference to everybody else. You need to figure out the answers for yourself and whether they're right. Now, that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that you just say, oh, um, I'm going to go question some some math theorem that's been established for a long time because not everyone can just sit here and rework some theory or go try to disprove the theory of gravity or something ridiculous like that. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have to take certain things based on faith or trust that mm -hmm. the scientific community, a consensus of inquiring minds has established these particular truths or principles as real and true. But it does mean that you need to have a healthy skepticism about things that are only provisionally known. I mean, all the, all the COVID stuff was happening so rapidly that you knew that you could not have enough information in mm -hmm. real time to form really adequate opinions about public policy because it was too new. Science doesn't, science is a process. It's not, you know, an immediate acquisition of knowledge about out, uh, external circumstances. So we couldn't immediately know how effective masks were. We couldn't immediately know whether vaccines might have long-term consequences. We couldn't immediately know whether herd immunity was a successful strategy. We just couldn't know because we were living it all in real time and science is a process. It takes, it takes time and it takes deliberation and it takes experimentation and it takes putting a community of minds together to work with each other's opinions and facts and data and to correct and revise things as they go. And so that's why the pandemic was such a, um, such a struggle as people were talking about follow the science, but you know, the science may not be there for another 10 years about what happened. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And another, it was just a really confusing time because I have asthma. And so I, I had to, to just, I can't wear a mask. I mean, I smother in them. I, I just can't do it. So I had to make, I, that's why I think everyone, there was a different decision for everybody. Like Phil could wear one. I can't. So I chose to stay home. Phil had a studio built for me. And so the, the rest is history with me, with the show. Wanted to continue with the show. Talked with all of my sponsors, took advice from them. And they said, yeah, just do it out of your home. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, that, that had to be the decision for me. I, I couldn't. It was not one size fits all. Yeah. And the show uh, has improved since you moved it to your oh, house. Yeah. Yeah. Best thing I could have done. I mean, the absolute best thing. So I'm 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 a success story in a sense, um, out of COVID. But but I couldn't listen to my liberal friends. I could not listen to my conservative friends because there was not a one size fits all. And I think we mm -hmm. need to let's talk about that when we get back from break. And that's mm -hmm. making decisions using your own mind. I like it. And not being spoon fed info because I think that's where we're all messing up. Let's go to a, com a commercial break. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. The Hatter Cafe and Country Inn is nestled in the northeast corner of Alabama the Beautiful in the delightful town of Mentone. We're located on top of scenic Lookout Mountain near Little River and DeSoto State Park and located only five minutes from shopping and restaurants. There is also a nearby community walking path and golf course. We welcome everyone through the doors and we are committed to outstanding service for all guests. At the Hatter Cafe and Country Inn, we invite people from all walks of life to come and get away from it all, enjoy the open spaces, treetop views, fresh, clean air, and experience Southern hospitality at its finest. 
We look forward to hosting you. To reserve a special event or if you would love a special getaway at the Country Inn, you can call us at 256-634-2018. Are you ready? We all wonder what tomorrow will bring, but the future lays itself at the feet of the prepared and surrenders to the will of the persistent. It's not easy, but today shapes you so you can shape tomorrow. With Northeast Alabama Community College, when the future asks if you're ready, you can answer. Yes. Begin your future at Northeast Alabama Community College. The only place I buy my beef is Lone Tree Ranch in Collinsville, Alabama. Their cattle is born and raised on their ranch, grass and grain fed, and you can feel confident when you serve your family and friends because their beef is all natural and no antibiotics or hormones are added. You can buy whole beef or perhaps go in with family or friends and buy half. Their customer service is number one as they take care of the delivery to their local processor and can deliver to your home for a small added fee. They also offer herd replacement heifers. I always call Lone Tree Ranch in Collinsville, Alabama for my beef specialty recipes and cookouts, and you can too. Food shortages are increasing, so buy local by calling 256-523-6462. That's 256-523-6462. Oh, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented bill and combined it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Because of all of you, my pillow 2.0 has been a huge success, and now we're bringing you our best-selling go anywhere my pillows with the same temperature regulating technology. Made with my patented adjustable fill and brand new cooling fabric, they're truly the next generation of MyPillow. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to save over 60% on our MyPillow 2.0 four-pack special. You'll get two MyPillows and two Go Anywhere MyPillows, regular $259.92, now only $99.98. King size, just $10 more. This is a limited time offer, so please order now. Donna's Designs offers a line of handmade memorial, wedding, and keepsake jewelry that launched back in 1970. I'm a self-trained jewelry designer, and I will work closely with you to create unique designs you can love and treasure for years to come. Whether that be flowers that were used in a funeral arrangement or stones you found on the beach at a memorable trip, call me at 256-659-4319, and let's think of the possibilities. At Limon's Mexican Restaurant, located in Henniger, Alabama, and voted Best Mexican Restaurant of DeKalb County, Alabama 2020, we're here to serve you with authentic Mexican cuisine. Order easily online by going to limonsmex.com or call 256-657-3999 to place your order. We're open Sunday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. and Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Whether you're celebrating a cozy date night for two or a celebration for a crowd, at Lamones you'll love our atmosphere and friendly servers. Thank you for dining with Lamones Mexican Restaurant. Good afternoon. We are back. My name is Donna, and I am your host of The Edge on IC Radio, your source for news and entertainment. You may also find us on television, Channel 182, on Charter Communications, and Abundance Television Syndicated, found on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire Podcast. I'll let you know about that just as soon as we get get that updated. Very excited about that. Team of folks who are working on that. It's happening actually sooner than they said. You know something, Alan Mendenhall is with us right now. Alan, by the way, is an author and a speaker. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Written any more books? Well, I have two coming out this fall. I've got my first novel coming out in November, so not not very far away. And 
it's currently available on Amazon by ebook right now, but the hard copies are not yet available for pre-order. I'm kind of anxious that that happens soon, like hopefully as soon as this week. But uh, then I have a, a, also a primer on ESG that's coming out uh, this fall. And again, that one's kind of in that sort of weird state of flux as well, where I don't know, I thought it would be out by now, but it's not. So maybe it'll be a month, maybe two months, but we'll find out uh, hopefully sooner rather than later about the status of those. Yeah, I'm excited about that for you. Very successful. Oh, Very you. successful. Okay, so we were before we went into break, we were kind of touching on this, this, this. I think it's really important to talk about. We've got the election coming up, and I'm not talking about just you know the presidential election. I'm talking about in your own neck of the woods, okay, so to speak. You're going to have a lot of elections are coming up. So, but it's being able to to research and make your own decision about things, not what's being sped through or spoon fed to you from either side, but using your own brain to make decisions. How can we do that? Well, it's an interesting question, Donna. I just got back from Cleveland yesterday. I was at the uh, fall meeting of the Philadelphia Society and the Philadelphia Society is an organization of mostly conservative and libertarians, intellectuals, journalists, attorneys, judges, um, think tank, and policy people, um, all on the right, all on the political right. And um, the purpose of the organization is to is the sponsor, um, the interchange of ideas through discussion and writing uh, to deepen the intellectual foundations of a free and order society. Well, that means that as the sort of mission statement says at the end, that they're going to seek understanding and not conformity. Because I'll tell you what, I've been going to these for, I don't know, 13, 14 years. I've been a member for a very long time, probably been a member for 12 years, um, over a decade for sure. And so I've been to many, many meetings of the Philadelphia Society and every panel that I see has disagreement and sometimes heated disagreement about some particular issue, some particular philosopher, some particular train of thought. And these are among friends. These are among people who, at least politically, vote more or less the same way. But they have extremely different views about um, a wide variety of matters. But it's, a, it, it's that willingness to debate and to form opinions around uh, disagreement that we are able to find our way through to better solutions. I, I think we can't just always, um, yeah, we, we tend to just pick pick our tribe, so to speak, and want to listen to whoever the loudest voice is on our side, or we want people who affirm what we already believe about a thing without challenging our assumptions and our priors. And that's not helpful either. I think we need to be critical thinkers. We need to be independently minded. Yes, we have a two-party system, so essentially in federal elections, you're going to pick one side or the other, but that doesn't mean that you are necessarily wedded to every single position that a particular um, uh, candidate takes. I think these days we try to push people into every single box and make them check every single box, or we have people that say, I'm not going to vote for this person because I don't like the way he does this or she does that, but they actually like eight of ten of the other boxes. And maybe that candidate, all things considered, is the better candidate for that particular voter. Mm -hmm. But that voter either sits out the election or votes for the candidate that only checks two of 10 boxes because that voter was really passionate about the, the two boxes, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And, and I think we're just not we're not asking enough questions. I, I think what's happening is sometimes when someone is running for office, we glorify them for some reason. Yeah. And basically what we're doing is we're hiring these people. It, it's as if you're the CEO of your own company and you are in charge of hiring. You're going to vet people. I mean, you're going to ask questions. You know, you sit down in front of them across the desk from each other and you're asking passionate questions because this is your business yeah. and you're passionate about it. I don't know, shouldn't the person we vote for, shouldn't we actually go through the step, the same steps? I mean, this is really important stuff. Yeah, it is. And it's it's difficult because you get into this sort of hyper reality or this simulated reality 
when you have one side spending, I don't even know how many millions are spent on elections these days, an astounding number. There are people who make their entire career off of politics who aren't even politicians and doing <laughs> polls and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. But, uh, you know, you've got millions and millions and millions of dollars being put in to elevate some narrative about the person that that side wants to promote into a hero or mythologize or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the astounding amount of money on the other side trying to do character assassination. But when you're the side that your guy is being attacked, you say, oh, well, these attacks are just all designed to make this person look bad. And then, um, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's so easy to dismiss criticisms that in some cases may be perfectly valid. I mean, the other thing is, you know, I think we should expect our politicians to be normal people and have lots and lots of flaws. Uh, I don't think they're, they're certainly, I mean, everybody's a sinner and they're certainly people um, who uh, have done great things with, uh, with serious character flaws and, mm -hmm. I don't think we need to expect perfection because if we hold people up to that standard, they'll never meet it. Um, mm -hmm. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking for people who are good role models that we would want to emulate, that we would want to tell our children, this is somebody you should be like when you grow up. Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to think that a lot of people who go into politics have, um, particular kinds of personalities, uh, you know, it's not the type of uh, thing that everybody is made for. And um, sometimes people get into politics for very wrong reasons. Everybody says they get into it for service, but a lot of people get into it for attention and for, um, you know, just this pure stimulation of it and, and the celebration around being a public official. But what I tell young people, when they ask me, should I get into politics? I'm thinking about getting into politics. I'll do something like this. I'll say, all right, let's do this experiment. Okay. You, yeah. you like ideas, right? Yes, I love ideas. I want to change the world. I say, okay, mm -hmm. name me the state senator from Connecticut in 1927. Oh, you can't do it? Oh, name, me, name me the federal senator, the U.S. senator from Connecticut in 1927. Oh, you can't do that. But what about 1957? Can you do that? State? No, no, you can't. Well, what about, you know, what about Wyoming in uh, 1972? Who was their U.S. senator? No, you don't know. And you just do this on it. And you really, the, 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 the point is, okay, well, then I'll ask you, well, who's Ernest Hemingway? Who's C.S. Lewis? Who's, you know, name any major philosopher. I mean, the people that have done the most, not necessarily for good, but over the course of the last two centuries, the people who've had the most influence on humanity have been really Darwin, Marx, and Freud. And they were people of ideas and they've had a ton of influence in ways that we don't even really fully understand because we operate in the environment that they created and we're just immersed in uh, their sort of thought structures. And so I tell people, if you really want to have an influence, maybe being a politician isn't the best thing. I mean, a lot of politicians are kind of interchangeable. It's just you can put any kind of nice looking person in a suit up there and they're going to vote the same way <laughs> as any other person. And uh, if, you, if you're really passionate about changing the world, you might want to get into the realm of ideas and, and write something significant because I tell you what, when you're alive and, and you're a politician and your reputation may be great, you may get the head table at all the parties, people may clap for you when you walk into the room, but once you're dead, no one's going to care because you don't hold that position anymore. It's as much about the position mm -hmm. and the that comes with it as it is about actually who you are as a person. And if you want to have a lasting influence, leave something lasting behind. Leave something that continues to speak to the, ne the next generations even after you're gone. I totally 110% agree with you with what you just said. You know, another thing I've noticed from people, is, there are people who have told me they voted. You can actually ask him who the vice president of the United States is. They can't they name know. her. Yeah. That's, that's upsetting to me. So let me ask you a question. Should there be some kind of a quiz given out? And here I am, I'm sounding like a dictator in a sense, but people should be somewhat knowledgeable, shouldn't they, before they vote? There are some people that I'm okay with not voting. I'll just tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, really, some people can't even tell you who the first president of the United States was. 
Who's sure. the, I, I think you should have some of that knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there, I mean, I personally think there would be nothing wrong with sort of a, a some kind of test for um, something pre pre prerequisite test or something like that. My, my concerns would be who's instituting the test, who's creating yeah. it, or what, that purpose, opens up more. Yeah. what type of bias or bent might get put into those kinds of things. So those are, they're, they're, they're all really problematic. I mean, obviously, voter fraud is, uh, is a tremendous problem. I don't know how great of a problem it is. I don't research that. So I don't know. I, you know, I've, I've read convincing stories that it is a problem, but I don't know how, um, you know, how big of a problem it is. Is it actually throwing elections? Maybe not, but, um, but it, it, it's, it's clearly not unproblematic. And we, of course, all want society to be as knowledgeable as possible. And we want people making, um, voting based on, um, as much knowledge as possible. And that requires a knowledge not only of the candidates, but of American history and traditions and institutions. And I, I worry about the knowledge of, of young people as somebody that's been in higher education for quite some time. I've met a number of young people who don't really know any history before 1960. They have some notion that, okay, America fought on the right side in World War II, and uh, there was a Great Depression sometime, and, you know, the North won the Civil War, and George Washington was our first president, and that's about it. And, and there's some that know less than that. And, uh, you know, I've had students at, um, in the past tell me something, well, you know how people thought way back when about blah, 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 and I don't know what they're talking about, because it's a class on, for example, like we're in the Western tradition and we're talking about the medieval period. And I, I don't know what way back when means. Like, are you, are you talking about the 1940s? Are you talking about the 1200s? Are you talking about the 400s? Are we talking, like, what are we, what are we talking about? But the students seem to have no context of different periods of history and different geographical um, diversity and, and all, all, I mean, all sorts of, of complexities about human history and experience that they just know nothing about. I think sometimes though, as parents and grandparents, they want to shelter their kids and their grandkids. Mm -hmm. um, my best financial advice came from both my granddads who lived during the De depression. Uh, but there was some success that came out of both of those guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of my granddads had a sixth grade education, the, the one we bought this farm from. And so he buys the farm back in 1939, sixth grade education, get it? Okay, he set himself a goal. He bought the farm for five thousand dollars. He could he didn't want to be in debt. Back mm -hmm. then, young man said, I don't want to be a slave to debt. I don't right. want to owe anybody anything. So he sets a goal to have the farm paid off in two years. And he did it. Uh, so amazing. And, well, so that's something because five thousand dollars is a heck of a lot of money back in that day. Yeah. Then my that, other Oh, and he, and he retired with the USDA, by the way, oh, wow. um, which the position he had now, you would have to have a pretty big degree to, to have this. Then my other granddad, I took a lot of financial advice from him as well. Now, he had a ninth grade education, mm. superintendent of companies, was on the police force, did all these amazing things with a ninth grade. Now, both of both those guys got their GEDs later on in life. Yeah, but you know, smartest man I ever knew. Well, it's fun. I'm so glad you just used that phrase because somebody was asking me the other day. I was out of state, and they said they were asking. It was kind of a silly question about like who who do you think like the most prominent intellectual in, in Alabama is? And I said, I'll be honest with you, the smartest person in Alabama is probably out working on a farm somewhere, and knows way more than any sort of credentialed person in any kind of ivory tower that person probably knows more about the agriculture the land the science behind it than than any intellectual spending all day in books and that person just applied his or her knowledge to those activities and pursuits rather than the person that decided to pursue some other thing but the, the but in terms of sheer capacity to know something it's probably somebody out farming somewhere or doing uh, you know, you know, some sort of uh, engineering work as, or, or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, uh, 
plumbing kind of work or in, in any kind of construction type of work. These people just know an amazing amount of stuff. Now, they may not be able to tell you some of the things that, that we were just talking about. They may not be able to distinguish between, you know, the Enlightenment and the Reformation and mm -hmm. the Evil period and Baroque period and you name it. Um, high Middle Ages versus Low Middle Ages. But they know a lot of stuff. And then if they applied their mind to those types of activities, they would know it. Um, and that's why I think it's good for people like that to obviously read and when they have their off time read as much as possible be as knowledgeable as possible you only have one life to live and there's only so much you can read in the time that you're given and so we all i think have a duty if if god has given us capable minds able minds we really have a duty to exercise there was a, a cross country i ran cross country in high school and there was a, a long distance runner named prefontaine and all these kids used to have this these prefontaine quotes on their shirts and it said to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift and for some reason that quote has always stuck with me and it's like if you if you have the ability the god given ability to read to write to ask questions to pursue knowledge you really have a duty to do it because it would be sort of the the biggest example of taking something for granted you know it would be just such a waste to let all that capacity go towards just hobbies or just pursuits you know if you can if you can make your hobby into learning that that just is so much better and yeah does it require a little bit of work but let me tell you after you do it a lot you i'm sure it gets easier and easier and becomes less work and more uh, exciting and fun Absolutely. And I love to read books, people like you who have written. And it, because you've been there, you've mastered it. Why do I have to recreate the wheel when you have the experience? You've written a book and, and I totally feel and I both admire you, Alan. Uh -huh. So because we admire you, I mean, what you've written is I mean, it's it's philosophy. I mean, it really is. Same with my, both my granddads. I mean, they were avid readers. And so I asked one of my granddads once, I said, have you ever thought about writing books? And he said, I don't have to. All the things, the knowledge I need has already been done. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm taking yeah. the shortcut. <laughs> he said, because, and, and a lot of it pertained to farming and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing as well, like you just said earlier. But I wanted to ask you a point blank question. Let's see how much time we have. Oh, we've got we've got plenty. We've got about six minutes left in this okay. segment. Time flies when I'm talking to you. <laughs> so, really this is this is a concern I have. Okay. And okay, so let's talk about skilled jobs. You just brought up plumbers and people like that. Welding, all those things are extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got you know a generation of folks who don't. I was taught um, you want to be the manager of a um, hamburger joint then you go flip burgers and find out what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You know, let's start at the top. That's how we were raised. Yeah. You know, do that. But we have a generation of folks and some of the older folks are in there too. So we have some folks who are retiring from these positions, made a lot of money. They're debt free. Mm -hmm. They may even be millionaires. We just don't know they are because they don't exploit it. They don't tell everybody. Right. But we're losing this generation. We're losing them. Then we have people who are coming in I'm concerned about work ethic. I'm concerned with simple little things about customer service part of your business. If you yeah. have no customer service, you don't have a business. No, that's that's exactly right. And I have concerns about education generally. Um, I think there are people who ought to choose liberal arts education and there's a purpose for it and that they need to be cultivated in a wide variety of fields and they have the mind and the capacity for it and they um, will do well from that sort of well-rounded form of learning and then there are people that um, maybe that's not what they're interested in and they're not interested in it at all and they shouldn't be forced to undergo that type of curriculum mm -hmm. and as somebody who's in a business school i look around at a lot of business schools and i think you know i'm not sure that these schools are really teaching anything that these students couldn't learn better if they just went out and got the job to begin with. Like, could they be learning, I don't know, name your field. This is what they want to major in and it's this particular field. 
but couldn't they learn it much better if they were out apprenticing somewhere or if they were out working for an accounting firm and then maybe supplementing what they're doing with sort of textbook reading and getting a broader perspective and seeing other elements of, uh, let's call it accounting, um, that uh, they wouldn't see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but are they being well served by going through these university systems or is just, you know, are we just, that's just the system we're in and, and people are just accepting it. But I don't think it's, I think something's got to give. I think tuition has risen to just ridiculous levels and people can't afford to take out student loans anymore. We can't just let tuition keep going up and, and young people being the generation saddled by debt. And that doesn't mean we need uh, bailouts for student loans, not at all. But it does mean we need to start working on the system a little bit so that higher education is not prohibitively expensive for a, a lot of people, you know, a lot of uh, hardworking people who come from sort of blue collar families or whatever, you know, it is that they just, they're not going to be able to shovel out $70,000 a year for a Vanderbilt, <laughs> a Vanderbilt degree, you know, and you don't, you know, if you're Vanderbilt, like, are you really getting, you, you purport to seek all this diversity, but you've got a tuition level that makes it impossible for any sort of like income based diversity to occur. Even if you do give away all the scholarships, you know, these people have a lot of other things. They still have to buy housing and everything else. And you're basically just taking off those perspectives just completely off the table. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of. Just but it has to be reasonable. I mean, it has to, Alan, mm -hmm. it needs to be reasonable. I have a friend who said, um, I'm going to go to Jack State, Jacksonville State University. Then later on, I'll go somewhere in California and I said what are you going to do and she said I'd like to be um, I'd like to be in acting mm, well. I said okay I, I said so you're going to you will be living in Hollywood or you know somewhere in California or whatever and she said no I'll stay here and I said well it doesn't I mean it doesn't make sense that you're planning on I mean where are you going to work yeah there's not much of a, of a um, there's not <laughs> Of a, yeah, demand I mean, for actors in this in this part of not, the world. Not here, not in mm -hmm. Geraldine, Alabama. Not not much of a demand. So you really have to know what your passion is, but there needs to be a demand for that passion. Right. That's exactly right. Yep. That so, is exactly right. I needless to say, she didn't do it. But but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had thought about being an accountant. So I got to college, and one quarter I knew that wasn't going to be my thing. I mean, it was just because I love and it was actually my parents impressed me on that decision because I was really good in math. I mean, you know, I, I could just like spout out. I represented the school in the math contest and all this stuff. So my parents said, you need to be an accountant. Well, I'm listening to them. And I'm thinking, I think I would be bored sick if I were yeah. in the, I, that's not a fulfilling job to me. So yeah. listen to your parents, but you also need to listen to yourself. Yeah. And I've found that like, Typically, you like what you're good at and you're good at what you like. And if you look hard enough for fields within that sort of window, you can find stuff. You just got to, but you got to work. You can't just, you're not going to get, this is a kind of advice for young people. You're not going to get your dream job right away. And there really may not be a dream job. I mean, work is work. You got to work. <laughs> so it's hard. If it weren't hard, it wouldn't be called work. But, um, but you can find work that is satisfying and fulfilling and it's just like working out like it's not particularly fun to go lift weights but the people who do it a lot they learn to love it and they can't do without it and you build yourself you get stronger and your muscles get bigger and you feel all these rewards you feel better you get healthier and that's kind of how work is you know when you first bench press bench press or whatever your thing is emails or whatever it's not necessarily Fun. It, it hurts. It's hard. But boy, yeah, does yeah. it feel great to have added value to the society in which you live. Well, I've got to say, listen to your teachers, because there is a teacher who is going to be looking at you. And so, Alan, I was um, going to send you a picture of myself. Um, I actually was in who's who when I graduated okay. from high school was quietest. But I had a teacher who saw some her name was Miss Ritchie. And she said, she said, you know what? You're going to be the first one to do speech. And I, I said, I'll melt. I will faint. 
I will pass out. I'll forget what my name is. I'll, you know, all this kind of stuff. And she said, but you're a cheerleader of people. She said, I've noticed that you prop people. She said, I've noticed that you just, you ask point blank questions about how, and she noticed in, in my speech that I would elevate people. Mm. She said, who knows? You could be a talk show host or something someday. And I'm just laughing to myself going, yeah, right. I could be a talk show host. But, but she brought out, not that I was, not because I was shy, it's that what I like to do, I like to champion people. I'd yeah. like to take an underdog. You're a promoter. And let the, yeah. And so that's, to me, that's what a talk show hit host is, is somebody who likes to promote other people to me. Well, the idea that you might be quiet is somewhat of a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. You can ask Phil. And a lot of people say, I bet you don't get a word in edgewise. And Phil goes, actually, at the house, she's quiet. <laughs> Alan, how can folks find your writings? We're going to have to call it a day. Time just goes by too well, fast. I guess the easiest way is just go to um, my website, which is www.alanmendenhall.com. Absolutely. Alan, a pleasure as always. Looking forward to next month. Thanks, Donna. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for watching. Absolutely. And we'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for watching. At Liberty Bank, we're all about community. Whether it's to help with a charity fundraiser or help families in need. Toys at Christmas or a local football team, we're here for you. You see, we realize the importance of family. Sometimes it's to build a new home or necessary home repairs. We're here for you. If you like the feel of a small town bank with all the conveniences of a big city bank, we're here to serve you. You will find us at any of our convenient locations in DeKalb, Marshall, Etowah, and Blunt Counties in North Alabama. You can call and speak with any of our friendly staff at 256-659-2175 or check us out on the web at libertybankal.com. And thank you for your support of our community. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Jeff McCurdy of the McCurdy Law Firm has been a public service of this area for over 10 years. McCurdy, a member of the Henniger City Council, serves as prosecutor for the town of Sylvania and was named public defender for the city of Rainsville. The McCurdy Law Firm is located at 17326 Alabama Highway 75 in Henniger to better represent his Jackson and DeKalb County clients. If you need to be represented by a true public servant with proven success, call Jeff at 256-996-8701 or send a private email to McCurdyLawFirm at gmail.com. No representation is made that the legal services performed is greater than the legal services performed by other lawyers. Oh, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented fill and combined it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Because of all of you, my pillow 2.0 has been a huge success, and now we're bringing you our best-selling go anywhere my pillows with the same temperature regulating technology. Made with my patented adjustable fill and brand new cooling fabric, they're truly the next generation of MyPillow. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to save over 60% on our MyPillow 2.0 four-pack special. You'll get two MyPillows and two Go Anywhere MyPillows, regular $259.92, now only $99.98. King size, just $10 more. This is a limited time offer, so please order now.